Josh, well, Josh is going to tell you what his research is about. So why don't you okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. It's, um, it's really a pleasure to be here. It's always fun to come back up to Berkeley and reconnect. Um, and so thank you. So before, before I start the, the talk, I, I need to make sure to give credit to the people who actually did the work. So when I say we did something, we means one of these people of, uh, on the long and growing list, um, including Terry Balser, who co-authored a paper with me, Claudia Booth, who's a postdoc working on some of the um, measuring microbial osmolites, Mariah Carbone, a postdoc with Chris Still, Noah Fear, a former student of mine, Trish Holden, another of Mary's former students, um, and, and a co-PI, Corey Lawrence, who did some of the modeling work I'll show. Um, Amy Miller, who is a postdoc working on some of the wetting and drying studies. Jason Neff, a collaborator with Corey Lawrence. Sophie, who started doing some of the, the summer work in California that got us confused and perplexed. Uh, Dadru Michelet, a current postdoc in the lab. Sean Schaefer, also postdoc. Um, Chris Still, a collaborator. Kathleen Traceder did some of the work on looking at soil fungi through the summer that I'll talk about. Matt Wallenstein, who is a postdoc in my lab, Martin Vetterstedt, um, actually a student in, in Lund in Sweden, and Sharang Siang, who is a postdoc. So these are the people who really deserve the credit for all the work um, that I'll be integrating and synthesizing here. So the first point is the world is a dry place. You know, if you look at the map of the Earth, much of it is arid, much of the rest is semi-arid. Little bits of important and interesting pieces are Mediterranean with extended dry periods. And most climate models project that even some of these green areas are going to be experiencing increased drought, longer droughts, more intense drought. So understanding the dynamics of drought and dry conditions in driving biogeochemical processes therefore becomes really an important thing to do. And most of the time we sort of assume, you know, it's dry, so there's nothing happening there. And what I'm going to show is that that's really not true. Um, and it raises the questions of you know, how will soil microbial processes change with increasing drought and more frequent drying rewetting cycles. Any kind of rapid change can be a stress and a, and a challenge. You know, even winning the lottery is a pretty stressful event for many people. Um, just as rewetting after a dry environment can be a pretty stressful event for many bacteria. It also ask the question then, what factors regulate these, these changes and the processes that occur as you go through drying and rewetting? And what effects will there be on large-scale biogeochemistry in terms of carbon release and storage, nitrogen availability and loss, and other kinds of large-scale biogeochemical processes? A lot of the real surprises that we see in biogeochemistry result from the coupling of very small microscale processes and macroscale phenomena. You know, the ozone hole was not possible until people discovered you know, surface chemistry occurring on micron scale ice particles in the stratosphere. Then all of a sudden we understood how you can create something that big, but that also requires global circulation patterns. Similar kinds of things, I think, occur in soil. So when we look at the way you know, classical biogeochemical thinking deals with stress of really any sort is frequently represented something like this. So if you look at a decomposition model, it says the rate of decay of a carbon pool is some first order decay function times a moisture function, a temperature function, the size of that pool. And the moisture function typically looks something simple like this. So this is just precip over potential evapotranspiration on a monthly time step. And it says when things are wet, things are fast. When things are dry, things are slow. That's the way biogeochemical models treat moisture. Um, well, is that really true? And that's the question we would ask. One thing this, this, this addresses is the idea that there's no effect of changing moisture. When you go from dry to wet, you just go from slow to fast. But nothing, nothing happens differently. It's just a change in speed. Well, but when we think about microbes, what do we have to think about when we start thinking about drought? Well, there are biological factors in terms of physiological stress. When soils dry out, microbes must deal with reduced cellular water potentials. They must deal with osmotic acclimation. And this suggests not just changing speed, but changing physiological patterns. And we also need to think about the physical dynamics in soil. 
that when soils are dry, diffusion rates of, of soluble compounds drop dramatically. And so we need to think about both reduced processing rates and potentially what I might call induced stress, that microbes may become resource limited because they're just unable to get resources and they're unable to acclimate that acclimating to things like osmotic stress should require energy, should require resources, and if they can't get it, they may become more stressed than they would otherwise. So this poses for us a core hypothesis that I'll sort of hold up against that rate, just rate function, and that, that that is that drought is stressful and that surviving it is expensive. And so when we started this work, this was the idea that we started with. And a number of things I'll be showing you are, yeah, it doesn't work the way we thought it should, and we don't understand how it does work. But I'll point those out. So this gives us several predictions of what we think should happen under dry conditions and when we, when we re-wet. One is drought should reduce microbial biomass. That's a first simple one. It's dry in California soils. You know, it doesn't rain for six months. This is what I've been calling you know, the dying season in contrast to the growing season. So biomass should go down. Certainly plant biomass you know, drops during the, the summer, so maybe microbes should too. And rewetting then should release microbial constituents and cause a flush of carbon and nitrogen. If microbes need to accumulate materials to survive drought, those materials should be released when the drought ends. As I will show, to some degree, both of those turn out to be wrong. So we're working mostly in California grasslands where I don't really need to explain this to you, winter growing season, summer drought. Our main research site is down near Santa Barbara, so a little bit drier than this area, but the same basic environmental conditions, the same basic annual grass dominated landscapes with oak woodland. So we look at microbial biomass and our prediction was should go down during the summer. So these are patterns through from May 07 into 09. Winter, here are the rain events, winter of 09. Microbial biomass, carbon in white, nitrogen in, in the black dots. And what happens? Well, there's what's going on during the summer. Biomass doesn't go down, it goes up. Consistently, what we find is microbial biomass in soil is highest at the very end of the drought. And immediately, with the, re with the beginning of winter, it starts declining. So what's going on there? But that's a very consistent pattern. And that increase is very sensitive to drought. It only occurs under extreme drought conditions. So we're also doing some studies on the Channel Islands where there's more fog inputs. And we have two sites, one where there's fairly low fog inputs and here we again see this going um, May 08, August. We're seeing the increase in biomass carbon through the summer. Here's December, and it drops immediately on the wet season. So this is a low fog, very dry system. And this is actually a, a, a Bishop Pine Forest site. But then we also have a, a, a site not very far away that gets more fog. And here, only in this most intense dry period, in these gray bars, are, are fog drip events. Only when the fog drip stops for a while do we see s some evidence of that increase in biomass. So it doesn't take much water to actually prevent this from occurring. It only occurs under the driest conditions, which is slightly weird. So the core hypothesis number one that biomass should go down when the conditions are rough is simply wrong. And that asks the question, well, why? Not only does biomass, but bioavailable carbon goes up during the summertime. Well, the first simple hypothesis would be that this is the accumulation of, os of osmolite. Microbes are in equilibrium with their environment. They must remain in water potential balance with the soil. If the soils dry out and they don't do anything, water will sort of leach out of the cells and they will shrivel up and die. They must accumulate solutes inside their cells to hold water in the cells to allow them to remain live and physiologically active. So this is one hypothesis, and it, based on pure culture literature, would seem to be a fairly reasonable one. The alternative is that this actually reflects growth of microbial populations and not an increase in the mass of individual cells, but an increase in the number of cells. 
So when we think about osmolites under unstressed conditions, we can think about the microbial carbon budget. Carbon comes in, some of that is used for maintenance energy, some of that is used for producing extracellular enzymes and acquiring new resources. Whatever is left is largely going to go into growth, and so into producing proteins, lipids, cell walls, et cetera, and replicating cells. When cells die, some of that was released as CO2. Some of it may go into soil organic matter. But when we say stressed conditions, microbes do different things, or so we understand or understood. Uh, carbon still comes in, maintenance still happens, resources still need to be acquired, but then the first priority should be survival, and that means producing compounds such as osmolites, molecular chaperones, other things that allow microbes to, to survive the stress. These are mostly soluble uh, material that's going to be sitting in the cytoplasm, and so you would see accumulation here. And then when the stress ends, you would expect those compounds to be released potentially in a big flush of CO2, less potentially going into soil organic matter. So this seemed like a good hypothesis based on much literature, uh, including some from, from Mary's lab, which is where some of these ideas started, in this brain at least. Um, and what are those osmolites? The physiological literature highlights that bacteria produce largely amino acids and quaternary amines. Fungi are, seem to be smarter in using resources that only use carbon, glycerol, and mannitol. These soils are bacterially dominated systems, and so we figured that these would be the dominant compounds microbes would be producing. So we decided to set out and measure them. And they can become, at least in culture, a very large fraction of total cell mass. Under some conditions, as much as 60% of bacterial nitrogen can be a contained in these compounds that look to be osmotic, uh, osmotic control agents. And if we scale this up to the whole ecosystem, looking at sort of a generic grassland with annual net primary production of 500 grams per meter squared, a very conservative estimate based on the physiological literature for carbon and osmolites would be about 4% of that, but that's what it would take for one drying event and that that would have to be replaced every time the soil is dry and re-wet. And so if, if the real numbers were less conservative or there were multiple cycles, that number actually starts getting fairly large. And if we look at the nitrogen that we would estimate in osmolites based in the soil, it could be as much as a third of total annual net mineralization. So the amount of, this is roughly the amount of nitrogen that plants would have access to and take up during the course of the year. And as much as a third of that could be accumulated in osmolites based on culture studies. So these are potentially large numbers. So we set out to measure them. So we take soil samples, we lyse them with the cells with chloroform, we extract the amino acids, we analyze them by HPLC, we use a, a, an unfumigated control to look at just background, and then um, Cellular amino acids are what we get in the chloroform fumigated treatment minus the unfumigated. And we've done various, you know, experiments where we add in amino acids and then do the extraction and all the, you know, the quantitative control stuff. So what do we see? Uh, no amino acids in, in unfumigated soil solutions. So we never see any background, even though this is a water extract of dry soils. No cellular pro proline, even though this has been commonly identified as a bacterial osmolite. The only significant cellular as amino acid we ever see is glutamate, and we see quite a lot of that, actually. But when we look at the patterns, this is glutamate as a proportion of the total microbial biomass. Here's the winters. This is glutamate carbon, glutamate nitrogen. And what do we see is that through two full years, glutamate is consistently about two and a half percent of total microbial carbon, and it doesn't vary very much through the year. Bit higher during the peak of the growing season in winter, here again, there's this one little spike here in the, in the late summer and one summer, but these are not the patterns that you would expect to see if this were an, os an osmotic agent, because then you would expect to see it starting to accumulate here as the soils start drying out and would stay high. In fact, this sort of drops, you know, right with this first little rainfall. This, this looks like it might be osmotic, but we don't see the same things happening here. 
it certainly doesn't really look like an osmolite. And the concentrations aren't high enough uh, by itself. When we just look at total glutamate as a per unit carbon or per unit soil, what we see is it tends to be highest during the late winter, which is the peak of the carbon input season when plants are growing. We would actually expect microbes to be growing fastest. Again, we do see this one blip here that we don't quite understand. But none of this is very consistent with glutamate actually being uh, really an osmolite. So how are microbes osmoregulating? They're not using amino acids is what we're seeing. Glycine betaine and other quaternary amines are one possible compound. We're analyzing those. Those analyses are not complete. But we don't see enough of it. It doesn't look like it, it's behaving that way either. Um, it's possible that glutamate is a constitutive osmolite. Some microbes do, do that. Um, but it doesn't look like there's enough there, that the concentrations aren't high enough to, to really justify uh, concluding it's an osmolite. The third possibility is just salt. We know that many organisms can use salt as an osmolite, but they are the osmolite of last resource and last resort. You know, before they die, they will accumulate salt. But in a situation where microorganisms are carbon starved and maybe even nitrogen limited, maybe it's not surprising that under natural soil conditions, they're just using salt and not using organics. Um, pure culture, we tend to give them lots of carbon so that they would use the preferred, not, not the default. So it doesn't appear to be osmolites that control microbial uh, populations. How about microbial growth, actual populations? Well, we've done some qPCR work um, with group level primers and looking at different groups. And there are some groups that actually don't change much during the summer. Several, like the proteobacteria and the, and the acidobacteria, that do seem to decline dramatically. And this is looking at the DNA for each group in which we took the total DNA and multiplied it by the percentage that showed up in a qPCR. So there might be some extraction issues between summer and winter, but. Um, but we don't see much evidence for any particular groups really increasing dramatically through the summer. Uh, it's interesting that the acidos decrease. I tend to think that acidobacteria are you know, the toughest bugs in the, in the dirt, and I would expect them to be fairly steady, but they actually decline dramatically. The proteobacteria I tend to think of as weeds, and so it's not a surprise. But no real obvious evidence of fungi accumulating, or bacteria accumulating. We've also looked at fungi through the summer, and this was work that Kathleen Traceder and her group did, where we put plastic tubes down in the ground, and then you run a camera down um, periodically and come back to the, to the same spot over and over and over again, starting in, in uh, April and then all the way through October, with some of these being daily images to look for more rapid turnover. And what you can see is that you can see the same hyphae and the same fungal structures in the same places. And then you can actually you know, match up the camera location to location and look for the appearance and disappearance of hyphae to actually look at fungal growth and fungal death um, through particular hyphae. And what, what we see is that as you go from sort of the end of the moist season, we see some act, you know, real death and disappearance. And then there's some increase in fungal hyphae through the summer. There's some production of new fun fungi, uh, even as the soils are hitting their driest conditions and soil temperatures are very, very hot. There's not a lot of increase, and we haven't actually sort of done enough of the math yet looking at fungal bacterial to see whether this could account for the overall increase in biomass. But it's still, therefore, not quite clear who it is who's increasing during the summer. That's still ongoing. So why would biomass increase during the summer? And this, I think, is an important question. Respiration is vanishingly low. Microbial activity is low. Soils are dry. So why would biomass increase? Well, pet hypothesis that I give somewhere in the range of about a 50% probability of maybe being right is that it may actually have to do with trophic dynamics. When soils are wet, pore spaces are interconnected. Bacteria and fungi are growing in these pores, but protozoa and predators can actually move through those water-filled pores. 
And so during the summer, or during the winter rather, microbial growth may be rapid, but microbial death may also be rapid because consumers can, can control population. But when we move into a dry summer condition, now this is a hydrologically disconnected landscape. There's still water trapped in tiny micropores. There's still water films on soil particles. There's still going to be mi microorganisms sort of caught up in these places where there's enough moisture to maybe be a little bit active. But protozoa are very sensitive to moisture. They go anhydrobiotic. They can't migrate because there are no water films. And so it's possible that predation or, or viral breakdown, things that require the movement of these consumers, is, is um, reduced even more than microbial growth. And so in this case, microbial growth might be very slow, but predation might be even slower. And if death is slower than growth, then populations will increase. So we've been do we're doing some work to try to start looking at this idea of shifts in, in trophic structures maybe being the thing that controls um, that change in biomass, but we're still not quite sure what it is. It, it, it is dramatic and important, I think, though, that it requires a very intense degree of drought before we actually see the increase starting. So what happens to nitrogen during this period? So this is, again, the same patterns of winters and summers. Uh, ammonium in black, nitrate in, in white. We see ammonia accumulate during the summer, which isn't really surprising. Mineralization continues to some degree. Microbes remain slightly active. If growth isn't very fast, there'll be some nitrogen release. But then what's interesting is that during the winter, I, well, nitrate is consumed as plants grow and microbes grow, but this transition occurs very quickly. As soon as the water hits, that ammonium is nitrified very rapidly on, on this kind of time scale um, to, to nitrate. And so the nitrifiers switch on uh, very quickly. This, too, is very sensitive to moisture. So again, we have the less fog, more fog. And what we see is in the less fog, we see this ammonium accumulation. In the more fog, much less so. So even a very little bit of ammonium will allow the nitrifiers to remain active and to convert that nitrogen to nitrate. What's going on here? And again, this comes back to our ideas about hydrological connectivity and the role of moisture in controlling microbes. In the winter, when soils are, are connected by, by water films, there are mineralizing organisms that release ammonium, and that can be then taken up and diffused to nitrifiers and converted to nitrate. But when the summers, the soils are dry, if you happen to you know, have nitrifiers and mineralizers in the same microenvironment, any nitrogen that is mineralized may be converted to nitrate. But some ammonium is going to be produced and released in environments where it cannot diffuse to the nitrifiers. And so it sits there untouched until this pore and this pore connect and the, and the ammonium can diffuse. So again, I think a lot of what's going on in regulating that ammonium nitrate switching has to do with this kind of hydrological connectivity in the, in the microbial landscape and what can actually interact with what. In the winter, we see a, a, a community that functions at a larger scale. In the summer, communities are collapsed down into these isolated little pockets that operate very distinctly from each other. So dry season conclusions. Microbial processes do continue if slowly. They are qualitatively different than those that occur during the moist season. And this, we think, has something to do with resource allocation patterns. Though we still don't fully understand what the hell is going on. It has a lot to do, we believe, with the physical controls and this idea of hydrological connectivity in the landscape. And importantly, as we think about larger scale biogeochemical dynamics, what goes on in the dry season establishes the antecedent conditions for the following wet season. Hydrologists know that a big rainstorm following a dry period does very different things than the same size rainstorm following a wetter period. And so the conditions that happen before you know, that rainstorm really control the dynamics. And so understanding what creates antecedent conditions is important at a biogeochemical scale. Hydrologists use this sort of as a euphemism for 
stuff happened, but we don't typically understand exactly what. So we're seeing some of the processes that regulate you know, biogeochemical antecedent conditions. Well, now let's switch from the dry to the wet season and think about what happens at that transition and the role of wetting and drying processes. Remember, biogeochemical models just say it gets wet, things speed up. Well, we've known for a couple of years, like since 1950, that um, when you take a, a dry soil and re-wet it, you get this burst of carbon respiration. This, this was what's known as the Birch effect after the, the fellow who first did it. You dry the soil, re-wet re it, you get another pulse. But if you just sort of dry it, wet it, and let it go, that pulse dec declines. So this is in direct contradiction to that idea of things just speed up and slow down. That re-wetting, the, the actual sort of phase transition of water creates these pulses of activity that may be very important in, in systems where, where drying and re-wetting is common. The challenge in dealing with the Birch effect in terms of linking mechanism to, to large-scale dynamic is there have been two major hypotheses for what causes it. One is what I'll call the microbial stress mechanism. The other is what I'll call the physical disruption mechanism. The microbial stress mechanism says that the material released and respired is cellular material. This is the osmolite release kind of idea. If that's the case, this is an enormously labile pool of carbon in the soil. And if this is the mechanism involved, it's microbial stress so that it may actually do damage or kill microbes in the process. Um, I used to say that the second worst thing you could do to microbes short of putting them in the autoclave was rewetting a dry soil from some w early work that Tom Keefe did in Mary's lab that showed 50% you know, loss of microbial biomass on rewetting. So if that was actually associated with death, this might reduce microbial diversity. So in a case like this, you're blowing off the most labile pool of carbon in the soil. Carbon that in a biogeochemical carbon sequestration concept is effectively already gone. And if you can reduce microbial diversity, what would be the effects on carbon storage in that case? Um, it might actually increase carbon storage. Because it's not important stored carbon you're getting rid of. And if you reduce catabolic capability, you might actually reduce attack. The physical disruption mechanism says that the carbon released is physically protected soil organic matter. So this is probably from a stable carbon pool. And if this is the mechanism involved, you would actually expect it to enhance microbial populations and capabilities, because it's making new carbon available to, to fuel microbes. So where this mechanism, if this is involved, it says drying re-wetting cycles might actually help stabilize carbon in soil. If this mechanism involved, it would suggest that actually drying wetting cycles should drive carbon out of soil. So here's a case where the coupling of the mechanism um, can be really important in, in understanding what the large-scale long-term impacts would be. Well, when we look at what happens through the summer, this is some work that Dodd did looking at the size of the re-wetting pulses in June, July, August, and September in surface soils and actually in subsurface soils. What we see is the re-wetting pulses get bigger and bigger throughout the summer, which is paralleling that increase in biomass. And it's hard to say then, is, is this a result of that or is this a result of other things? It's also paralleling an increase in just the pools of dissolved organic carbon or extractable organic carbon in soils. So the size of that pulse is clearly a function of things that have been happening during the dry season. But what? Well, we decided to try to test the mechanism, and this some years ago now is a study Noah Fearer did, where we added C14 glucose to the soil. We incubate that into the microbial biomass for eight days. So we're producing a kind of a labeled microbial pool in an unlabeled soil pool. We then dry the soil for three days to stress the microbes and then re-wet it and measure both the amount of CO2, the amount of biomass, the amount of dissolved organic carbon we can pull off, and the C14 enrichment of each of these pools to see where is that carbon coming from in those pulses of CO2 and DOC. So here's the, the data. This is the sort of pre-incubation period. 
the drying period when we weren't able to measure CO2, the post rewetting period. This is the enrichment of CO2, and these are two different soils. So what you see is the C14 of enrichment of CO2 equilibrates, we dry, rewet, and the CO2 that comes off is very hot. And then that declines rapidly back down to a level slightly below where it had been. Now, when we look at the total biomass, the enrichment of just overall biomass was right around here. So what this suggests is that that C14 equilibrates into biomass. The CO2 is in equilibrium with biomass. And what comes off is a small fraction of what was in that biomass. So this supported the osmolite idea. This is either a small pool within all the cells, or it's just a small fraction of microbes that, that die and release carbon. The extractable organic carbon, the DOC, was cold. So the rewetting releases minerally protected carbon that is not respired and is not labeled, and it releases microbial carbon that was labeled. So this was really pretty compelling that, yeah, the carbon released is, is, is microbial. It may be that osmolite material. We also wanted to look at what organisms respond to that flush of carbon. And so we did that using a bromodeoxyuridine study. BRDU is a thymidine analog. It's incorporated into DNA as DNA replicates. You can use a, um, an immunocapture technique to pull out the BRDU DNA, and then you can analyze it. So we did that using both t reflip uh, fingerprinting technique, and then pyrosequencing to look at the specific organisms of, you know, is everybody responding equivalently to that initial flush of carbon, or, or is it a targeted group of, of organisms? What we found was, this is a, uh, just a, um, an NMDS uh, ordination plot. The bulk community stays remarkably consistent through all of these. The BRDU DNA is very distinctly different, and we see some time courses as you go from 12 hours after rewetting out to 48 hours. When we looked at the composition of those communities with pyro, there's way too much data to look at, and I only got this about three days ago. The total community is, has a huge amount of actinobacteria, uh, a lot of alpha proteobacteria, very few in the way of bacteroidetes, very few in the way of gamma, which shows up in the BRDU DNA after um, 24 hours. It's a huge proportion of bacteroidetes and a lot of gammas not so much actinos, not so much alpha, but these increase dramatically over the next 24 hours. So that the actinos seem to be growing over the 48 hours um, following rewetting, um, but but it does seem to be a very small fraction and very different organisms. Some of which, when Noah sent us back the the data, he said, "I'm really worried about contamination because some of the specific isolates." Uh, that we're pulling up are things that people tend to think of as like water system contaminants. It's like, well, our negative controls are negative, so I don't think it's contaminated. And maybe the reason you see these organisms in these weird systems is because they're weeds that can respond to these conditions. So we're, we're trying to integrate some of these, these data to, to sort of look more closely at what's happening in that rewetting period. But that's sort of focusing on the microbial side of where's that carbon. And it looked like microbial carbon. But then we had this study from Amy Miller where she did rewetting cycles every either two weeks or four weeks, two weeks in, in red, four weeks in blue, and looked at respiration. And what she saw was, yeah, we get these nice peak, peak, you know, very nice rewetting response pulses. But when you rewet them every four weeks, the pulses are twice as big, which is consistent with what Dodd saw that the longer the dry period, the bigger the pulse. And what's really interesting is the total amount of carbon released is about the same in both of those conditions. So if we look at the size of the, of the amount of carbon respired over the entire experiment relative to the, per, the moisture content and percent water holding capacity, these are soils that were kept under constant moisture. These were the rewetting treatments. This is the, the two-week rewet. This is the four-week rewet. And what we saw was significantly more carbon is released in these, from these multiple pulses than was released even under the most optimal constant moisture condition. And in fact, this difference is greater than the amount of total carbon that was in the microbial biomass at the beginning of the experiment. So that suggests that that carbon is not microbial carbon. What is it? 
and this was actually in Chaparral. We did a similar study um, on grassland soils, and what we found was, here's the init biomass initially, biomass under continually moist condition, and biomass at, under multiple 12 rewetting cycles, and the biomass goes up. So more carbon is released from the soil than was in the biomass, and the biomass also goes up. Ergo, it's not microbial carbon we're releasing. We are mobilizing carbon from mineral, mineral pools, from, from protected pools, and we are feeding the biomass. So it's not microbial carbon. But NOAA's study said it was microbial carbon, and that's kind of a contradiction. So how do we start reconciling these things? How do we reconcile data suggesting the pulses are microbial with those suggesting it's physical? Well, the hypothesis that we had put together was that microbes accumulate osmolites. That's now, I think, a questionable hypothesis. Um, on a rewetting event, that's released as CO2, but there's also this flush of mineral carbon from things like aggregate disruption and other processes that becomes released in the soil that as soils then dry down again, that that would be taken back up and that microbes would synthesize it into new secondary materials, potentially into new osmolites or other kinds of cellular materials, and that that would be released again on rewetting. And that this kind of coupling of physical processes and physiological processes might explain that otherwise, a, you know, very strong contradiction in those data sets that says that in a single rewetting cycle, it's microbial carbon that's released but over multiple cycles, it must be physical soil organic matter carbon. I don't know where we stand on this because I don't know how to deal with uh, that NOAA study of we can't, we don't see the osmolites at least in nitrogen compounds when we're working on the carbon compound, um, yet it was clearly microbial carbon, so what is, what is happening here? One thing that's important is we never see any evidence of any significant declines in microbial biomass just from a single rewetting event or even multiple cycles. So the idea that that's actually lethal to organisms, I've, I have kind of gone away from. I think microbes actually survive drying rewetting cycles quite well, um, even if they release carbon, even if there is this flush of resources. But what those resources actually are, we still don't know. Um, so what really seems like it's going on is that there are processes going on during the dry phase that's releasing microbial, uh, microbially available material that then is then metabolized on rewetting. And what are those processes could be occurring? Some of it might be exoenzyme attack, because exoenzymes probably don't need very much water to be active if they're sitting on an organic fragment. Some of it might be sorption and desorption dynamics, mineral interactions of, of uh, organic mo molecules with clays. One thing we do see is that when we look again across this period from 07 to 09 and look at dissolved organic carbon and nitrogen, really it, I should be calling it extractable organic carbon and nitrogen because in October I don't think it's in solution, but these pools do increase, which may explain why, why Dodd saw bigger rewetting pulses here when there was just a lot more of this material in the soil than here. So there are things happen, happening while soils are dry um, under conditions where microbes can't get at this stuff that they accumulate and then become available when the conditions become primed. We see similar things in the Arctic work when soils are frozen. Things accumulate and then are flushed when they, when they re-wet. And it goes down when things are wet. So then, to sort of start wrapping up this, how do we start trying to integrate these kind of fine-scale microbial dynamics into larger-scale models? Because ultimately, models are the tools we're going to use for linking across scales and integrating physiology and, and large-scale biogeochemistry. So what we know is that the models we have tend to do a bad job um, under these conditions. These are results from Descent, which is a large-scale biogeochemical model that runs on a day time step, and it's the, the traditional century model otherwise. This is stream flow over years from 85 to 99 in a chaparral, and what it shows is it does a pretty good job on the hydrological pattern. When we look at nitrate export, so as an index of capturing soil carbon and nitrogen dynamics, 
um, on the lower axis. Here's a period from 95 to, through 98, which was a very wet period in California. And, you know, the model doesn't do terribly. You know, it's hard to actually know how good good is or how bad bad is in these kinds of data. But these, at least, are capturing about the right kinds of patterns. When we look at the, the drought period of the late 90s into the mid, in, or late 80s into the mid 90s, what we see is that, you know, the model did an absolutely abysmal job of capturing those pulses. And that's typical. These kinds of models are based on a quasi-state, steady-state assumption that microbes are in equilibrium with their resources and their environment. And when you're dealing with a pulsy, flashy environment, that's not true. They don't deal well with non-equilibrium conditions, but that's what we're talking about. So we need models that don't make the assumption that microbes are in equilibrium with their substrate pools and environment. That means adding some microbial mechanism. It means considering shifting microbial resource allocation patterns to think about where carbon goes. And it means integrating physical controls on carbon supply to microbes. So and the question is, can we do better than these simple first order models? And so Jason Knapp and Corey Lawrence and I put together a simple model. This is the simple first order carbon model where there's light fraction organic material, dissolved organic carbon, and heavy mineral bound stuff. That can go into microbes which respire to CO2 using simple first order pool driving the flux. And then we built uh, several models, but the most complex has microbes that make exoenzymes that convert light and DOC material into a bioavailable DOC. That then gets taken up by microbes. The decomposition is catalyzed by enzymes using what we call reverse michaelis menten kinetics. The enzymes can saturate on the substrate instead of the substrate on the enzymes. Uptake is more michaelis menten And we use the Amy Miller data. And what you have a hard time seeing in here is, so this is the simple first order model relative to the black line. There's the black line. The first order model actually did a pretty miserable job of capturing these dynamics, um, even here early on. Two other sort of intermediate complexity models, and then the most complex model. What we found was, interestingly, not surprisingly, the most complex model captured patterns the best. When we looked at the statistical power of the models, which account for the number of degrees of freedom as well as the quality of the fit, this was the best model. But what was the second best model in statistical power? It was the simplest one. This one didn't do a very good job of capturing the patterns, but it had so few variables that it still has a lot of statistical robustness to it, which highlighted that, that simply adding some degrees of mechanism weren't necessarily in improving the model, that you actually had to capture the right ones. And we think this one worked because it captured this idea of allowing materials to accumulate that would then be used when it rewet. But interestingly, in all the models, when we did sensitivity analyses, what was most sensitive to capturing pulse dynamics were the microbial parameters, not any of the carbon pools or anything like that. So even in the first, in the first order model, to capture the timing of these fluxes, it was the microbial turnover rate, the turnover of biomass that was critical. To capture the magnitude, it was respiration efficiency, how much of the carbon used is respired. What is the DOC turnover rate? In the enzyme model, the enzyme turnover rate was critical in capturing the timing. How fast were enzymes produced, and how fast did they degrade? The magnitude had a lot to do with how fast microbes could actually use material and how fast they turned over. So to capture pulses, you need to capture essential microbial dynamics. So conclusion on the modeling. Single-scale biogeochemical models do poorly because they don't capture fine-scale details. It's essential. Even a simple model that incorporates some microbial mecha mechanisms with a larger carbon pool model captured pulse dynamics actually quite well. And as, as I move into overall conclusions of what we think we've learned from this, and, and at this point, I think I'm moving backwards in understanding some of these systems and trying to reconcile some of these data sets that are still it's like, where, what are the osmolites and how do these data go together? What do we think we're learning? Um, 
I think this is an important conclusion that biomass lay by carbon pools that these things actually start increasing when soils are very dry, but that they need to be very dry and there seems to be some critical threshold with just a little bit moisture than that and all of a sudden the system sort of shifts to a different state. Um, we hypothesize that those results break down from a connectivity in, in the hydrological system within the soil, within the micropores and the macropores that constrain nutrient and, and, and carbon diffusion and may constrain faunal movement and that when these things stop moving, the system collapses into this other state. And that finally, that, that models that separate the generation and consumption of available carbon can capture these dynamics. You don't necessarily need to have an enormous amount of microbial complexity, but if you can just kind of create the processes that, that separate the separate functions and that allow them to operate more independently of, of each other, you can at least create models that capture these complex microbial dynamics more effectively with still a manageable number of parameters. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are questions, and I don't know if I have answers. <laughs> <coughs> Mary, uh oh. Yeah. We do see ammonium. Because we're <laughs> um, because as with most research, I think you know you sort of pick up ideas from different places and start weaving it together. But uh, microbes must osmoregulate. I mean that I do believe. So far. No, at some point, at some point you, you, they are struggling. So, yeah, so I think we're still at that stage where those ideas are still being fully integrated, you know, and, and, and I think because so many of the studies on osmoregulation are done in pure culture with high resources, you know, you sort of get this idea of, well, this is what they're supposed to do, and, and salts are a really miserable way of doing it. If biomass is increasing, it actually looks like populations are doing okay, so, how yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I believe it has to do with living biomass, but it may, not, it may not capture those dynamics in terms of what the populations are doing. And so, as, you know, as Bob Sinsabaugh pointed out once, you know, in soil, all our methods suck. And there's a lot of truth to that, that everything we do has major perturbations and major limitations that, you know, we're always struggling to try to put together these, you know, six different ways of looking at the elephant to try to figure out what, what it is. And I think we're still in that phase of trying to pull more of these different techniques to really look at what do these numbers mean, how do they fit together, and, um, and, and how do we reconcile them into a single story that actually fully makes sense when we still have a number of different data sets that, that um, I'm still not quite sure how they all fit together. But, you know, yeah, the amino acid and the nitrogen osmolite I think was a good thing to test and I think it's really interesting that, yeah, they're not there. And I think it's an important thing to, you know, to validate that and I think we are. Now we need to look more at, at more at some of the carbon compounds because they may be that they are actually still accumulating carbon compounds but they're still pretty carbon limited. This is not a nitrogen limited system, it's a carbon limited one. And then when do
a couple. First, um, the biogeochemical models are based on an assumption that microbes are in equilibrium with their environment. And, 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 and I agree with you exactly what you're saying, and that's been one of my arguments of, you know, this is the way biogeochemists think when we look microbially. We know that that is, is not true, though biogeochemistry works on time scales that are quite long, which is one reason they make that assumption, that, that in short time scales, no, they're never in equilibrium. When you sort of average out over weeks or months, maybe so. In terms of water potential, um, yes, they probably do need to stay in, in, in equilibrium because water can move fairly freely across membranes and bacteria are in intimate association with water. So that's one where the equilibration is going to be quick. Yeah. But part of the issue here is one of, of time scale and the time scale at which microbes are doing microbe things and biogeochemists are thinking biogeochemical things and the assumptions they make about microbes. And part of what I'm trying to show is, yeah, those assumptions don't work under these cases. Um, in terms of community shifts, the bulk community doesn't seem to change um, dramatically. In some ways, we've seen some patterns. We're still working through some of those data. And to what extent these patterns are shifting of activity is work we're still working on. Again, this is you know, a long-term project that is in ongoing transition, and we're constantly trying to add new pieces to it. And some of the community dynamics and community activity things are part of that. And people in Mary's lab are working on similar things, and I hope we'll be able to integrate some of those insights. Wendy. In the stuff on the standing dead, I think that's possible. That particularly since we see these pretty big changes in pattern with just fog inputs and not, not a huge amount of water. So when you've got a lot of litter either sticking up from the surface or just sitting on that very thin layer on the surface, fog inputs might be important in regulating what's happening in the litter zone. But very little of that moisture, I think, actually penetrates down below the top, you know, sort of fragments. And, and we see those kinds of dynamics in, in, the, in the fog sites on the Channel Island. When you get a lot of fog, we see a moist condition. But even where you get less fog, it seems to go into this more sort of dry season pattern. And, and that was actually on, on more on litter, not even in the mineral soil. So I think the mineral soils of these sites are pretty insulated hydrologically from that sort of dew and, and fog inputs. Oh, and I have seen some data from a study in Israel um, where the, the student who was presenting it was going, I don't get this. But they were see she was seeing exactly the same kind of pattern that um, in those soils. But I don't remember what they were, whether those were real desert soils or not. Um, I've heard some things from some desert studies sort of anecdotally that, yeah, they see some of those same kinds of, yeah, things, things sort of go up rather than down. That microbes seem quite quite adapted to handling those conditions. Um, and so they don't really die back the way, you know, I think more plant thinking, you know, would have, would have prepared our brains for. Oh, yeah. 
Well, these were mostly in annual grasses. So during the growing season, what we certainly see is plants drawing down nutrients and supplying carbon and lots of active dynamics. By May, when you're sort of hitting the dry season, they're mostly, they're mostly dead. And so what's happening on those dead roots um, dur during the summer, I'm not completely sure. But if carbon is a limiting resource on the mineral phase, for microbes that are sort of growing in that now, you know, it's kind of ghost rhizosphere dynamic, that might actually be a carbon-rich environment. And it would be really interesting to look at microbial dynamics on dead roots in, in an annual system. But we've never, we haven't done that. I don't know, Mary, have any, have any of your group in the rhizosphere work, worked on dead root dynamics? <laughs> okay, you've, you've got more of the toolkit for, for doing some of that than I think than we do. Yeah, JP. And SIR biomass, actually, as well. It's not just chloroform, if I, I think. Yeah. Right, and, and that's one of the things that we wondered about. If it is an accumulation of cytoplasmic material, that should be more fumigatable, and so you would see a stronger fumigation response than, and, than the actual total biomass response, potentially. But yeah. Right, and that's... And, and that was, you know, one study. And, of course, you know, the challenge with something where you're trying to pull together the pieces that, you know, 17 different postdocs and grad students have done is not everything is all matched. And we have more data that we haven't actually pulled together yet and made sense out of. Um, I, I think actually even some microscopy would be a really interesting thing to do just to look at cells. Because also if cells are going into, into a starvation mode, they may actually be shrinking rather than than expanding. And so there are a number of things that could be going on at the cellular and physiological level that might be important in understanding some of these dynamics. Um, and, and again, this is still, for me, very much a work in progress. About a year ago, I thought we had a really nice story put together, and it actually started falling apart a bit in the last year. So, yeah, Sarah. The distinction I see is that if it sort of comes straight out of the soil, straight through the microbe, and gets respired right away, it's, it's never actually been part of microbial biomass. It's just a compound that's been dissimilated. And in, and in the deep soils, the CO2 that comes off in those dry and rewetting cycles comes from a pool that has an average radiocarbon data six to 800 years old. So we're actually able to kick off some pretty old stuff. And I think it's, it's, it's respired very quickly. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it microbial. Even though it passes through the microbes in a carbon pool sense, I wouldn't ever call it microbial carbon. Can you speak more about your um, changes with the mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, and we do see some organisms responding. I mean, that's some of the um, the BRDU data. But in terms of, we don't see big. We don't see changes in sort of the bulk biomass necessarily from single rewetting events. But in, in deep soils, particularly that are carbon starved, we can increase biomass by a factor of six through a series of drying rewetting cycles, and that and 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 that's clearly mobilizing quite you know, old carbon, that if you just moisten the soils and just leave them under optimal moisture, you get a little blip of respiration, it goes to zero. Uh, 
So you dry it and re-wet it, and you dry it and re-wet it, and every time you re-wet it, you get another blast of carbon, and you get another kick in the biomass. So in some of these, you can actually mobilize quite a lot of carbon just from drying and re-wetting. And whether that's a desorption or whether that's just mass transport, the carbon that isn't diffusing effectively over the long distances that, that occur in soil, you know, because it's basically life in a chromatography column where a re-wetting event is creating a wetting front and a redistribution, what the balance of those processes, I'm really, I, I don't know, but I'd be interested to. Kathleen. I'm sure that some organisms do, but for example, the data I just saw from Sarah yesterday is, you know, that while well, nitrifiers may take six or nine or 12 hours, you know, to gear up, carbon meta metabolism is, you know, within minutes. And so there are a lot of organisms that are primed and raring to go within minutes of rewetting. If you go back to some of um, Phil Brooks's, you know, old data from 20 years ago on adenylate energy charge, what they found is that even in a dry soil, microbes had an AEC of, you know, 0.9, which is what you expect to see in a, in a physiologically active growing cell, where spores, you know, should be down at 0.3. I never was real happy with those data, but they're very consistent with the idea that microbes can at least turn on carbon metabolism extremely quickly, you know, within, within minutes as opposed to even within hours. We've, we've thought about both of those things. Um, many different taxa of bacteria use, at least in culture, common pools of compounds, either amino acids, and we scanned, you know, the entire suite of amino acids in these studies. And the only one we were ever able to measure was glutamate. And others use quaternary amines. So we've been doing some of that. And Claudia has also been doing some more just total metabolite analysis to look for other families of compounds that might show up in a less targeted analysis. The other thing we have thought a lot about, particularly given that Trish Holden's been a co-PI in most of this work, is the idea of biofilms. Biofilms can delay desiccation. They cannot prevent it. So they will slow down the loss of water, but it will eventually catch up with them. And so I think what biofilms can do very effectively is potentially maintaining a hydrological connection for longer but ultimately, water potential should still equilibrate. Um, and so we have been doing some work on, on microbial sugars and trying to think about looking at allocation into, into, into um, biofilm compounds. So yeah, we thought about that. And, and I don't think that that alone can explain some of the patterns that we're seeing, but may well be an important component of some of those shorter term responses. Of course, if the system's carbon starved, EPS, excess polysaccharides, are kind of carbon expensive compounds. So to what extent microbes are actually able to, to do that? Um, you know, we've been thinking about doing some experiments to look at production where we actually feed microbes carbon and nitrogen through the gas phase instead of having to rely on aqueous things as we always do and, and trying to look at some of those dynamics. But some of those experiments, are, you know, we haven't done them yet and they're sometimes a little tricky. And they always have their own quirks and, and problems. Roman. Um, Dodd has done some long-term dry incubations, but not, you know, but not long enough that we've sort of 
seen an endpoint to the processing, and, and that's that's months. And even in the field, it's uh, it's it's you know six months of, of of drought. So I don't know how long it would take to sort of see things stopping, or or what even would cause that. I mean, it might be that some of that carbon is coming from breakdown of roots and enzymes that are supplying some carbon from those dying roots, and maybe, you know, I don't know where the carbon is entirely coming from. Uh, the, 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 the radiocarbon date we get when we do a rewetting study, um, and this was done with uh, Martin Vetterstedt when he was visiting from Lund and, and through Trumbor, is, is, is pretty modern. And so we can't peg that down super tightly. Um, it, my suspicion is that exoenzyme activity is less water sensitive than microbial consumption, and that's kind of what we had to do, I think, on some of the modeling where you have enzymes and microbes. Because if you have an enzyme on a, on a piece of organic debris, it can remain active with probably less water than it takes to get that substrate to transport. Um, but th those are questions that I'm still not sure. And I'm still not sure to what degree the carbon is you know, desorbed from mineral surfaces and so older, whether it's being released from enzymes. We're, you know, we're planning some experiments that will actually start getting at some of those kinds of dynamics. But that's sort of a direction that we're trying to take this work in. These soils are pr pretty comfortably near, you know, just slightly subneutral, if I remember right. But we've never looked at actual sort of major changes during rewetting. So, what are what are you thinking that might be going on? Oh, yeah, yeah, or, or be sensitive to that immediate local pH. No, we've, we've never really thought about that. Up in the back corner. Yes. Through production of materials and things, the yeah the the saturated zone in these soils is deeper than we can typically measure, and we've put down in our research sites we put groundwater wells in and there's a stream right near the site, we've drilled 20 meters down and um, hit and it's been dry except during the peak of a wet winter, um, which surprised me because earlier in you know when in a wetter period of, of, of history, the stream has run perennially. But um, in other sites, we've dug five meter deep pits and looked at what's going on down to five meters, and those are dry consistently. So these are sites where water table is very, very far down and does not appear to be connected to the surface soils in any way. But it takes an enormously wet, you know, massive El Nino year to ever fully saturate these profiles. So I'm not, we don't actually know where the groundwater is coming from, but it's not actually just sort of moving down from the top and then appearing there. It's coming from other parts of the landscape. Yeah, during the winter, these soils saturate. 
but that saturation rarely extends very far. Again, this is, you know, we think about lots of systems where the, uh, you know, the Vado zone is the unsaturated zone and then a groundwater. That isn't the way these systems seem to operate. There's no sort of saturated zone that is sometimes connected to the surface. So there can be anaerobic processes certainly going and gas exchanges going on. When we've measured gases through the soil profile, um, we rarely see much evidence of, you know, oxygen depletion that we haven't looked in this immediate surface during, you know, sort of the peak of a storm when soils are saturated. They're very clay soils, and so I'm sure that there is some anaerobiasis. Um, how that affects the community composition or community activity during some of these periods, I'm not sure. Um, but certainly during the summer, these soils are highly aerated and consistently aerated. Yeah. Sarah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Somewhere in there, I think. So I was I'm wondering if it was that type of volume in the area that could have contributed to the saturation of the water so that it could be used for some of the other types of vegetables that have more stable soil that might have actually made have if you're if you're in a watershed that would take that back, it might decide to invest in a much more powerful Yeah, well, being in a water film still means being water stressed because water potential equilibrates. And so even if you're in water, it doesn't actually mean that you're experiencing, you know, it, well, I was going to say it doesn't feel wet, which is a really silly way to say it, but it's close <laughs> enough for, for now. Um, yeah, I tend not to think of this stuff as being recalcitrant as well, is that the material that's physically protected, I think, is actually chemically quite labile but it's protected and when it is either absorbed or transported, it's, it's actually quite easy to metabolize. Um, chemical recalcitrance, I think, when we're dealing with mineral soils is probably a very bad concept in general. I think there are very few molecules that are truly chemically recalcitrant. Um, I'm coming to an increasing conclusion that when we think about, you know, that, that to put it simply, catabolism is irrelevant. Um, that if microbes can get access to a molecule, they can process it. That what really matters when you think about carbon storage is going to be the physical access and what microbes do with it. Sort of it's the more anabolic stuff, I think, may be more important in regulating carbon storage than catabolic capabilities per se. Uh, I may well be wrong on that. I frequently am. But it's, it's, a, it's a fun hypothesis to pose since so many people are interested in catabolism. That's different if you're thinking about litter and organic fragments. It's, you know, completely separately there. Litter is clearly enzyme and, and catabolism regulated. But, the m but one of the challenges I face is increasingly what we're hearing from the cell chemists is the models of what soil organic matter is, is not these sort of big, you know, polymeric stuff, but small, you know, molecular aggregates of things. And, and we've been developing these models of exoenzyme activity. It's like microbes shouldn't need exoenzymes to process that. Those are things that should be able to be taken up into a cell and attacked with endo endoenzymes. And so, you know, one of the challenges that I think certainly I'm facing is sort of how to integrate these sort of changing perceptions of what soil organic matter is with our perceptions of what microbes are doing with it. And how can you have multi-thousand-year-old carbon when it, it's really fairly small, not that complicated molecules? Um, but those clearly have to do with physical, physical and chemical mechanisms of absorption, dis dissolution, reducing the activity, rather than it's truly chemically recalcitrant and can't be processed. I mean, even with black carbon, these are models are saying it's smaller fragments rather than bigger fragments and things that maybe microbes ought to be able to get their teeth into. So, yeah. 